I got your Bibles. <coughs> Turn to the book of Second Timothy. You have your Bible. Tonight we're going to talk about letting the Bible be the authority in our life. Some people have currently or have had a problem with authority. We often go through that in our um, transition between childhood to adulthood. We start rebelling against authority. Um, we rebel against the authority of our parents, of our teachers, of the police, of the government. And a lot of times it does not end until you become the authority in someone else's life. You start to appreciate the fact that authority is not bad and is very mature to actually submit to authority. In our spiritual walk, that's really how you become saved is by submitting to God through Jesus Christ. And submitting to Him is something that people struggle with for a very long time. So often in our lives, we like to give God some. Some of us, some of our, our love, some of our attention, things like that. But giving Him everything is a very hard thing for most people. Trusting God with everything, it's almost as if um, it's a process or a journey. And some people, I know, they just never really get there. As far as like, being able to sing, I surrender all and mean it, that's a very hard thing. I hope this helps you. This is one of the solas. It is number two. It's about the Word of God. This is one of the foundations of our faith. And when you hold your Bible, this is not like any other book that you have at your house. Not like any other book in the library. I have read other books. You can read books and understand them, quote them, recite passages out of them. But this one right here is different. Because the meaning of the words on the page, they... Never change what they say. They don't necessarily change what they mean, but they can change how they move you and touch you at different times in your life, different situations. And it is because this book is alive. Now, for somebody that's cynical, they may say, you know, preacher, you're crazy. A book can't be alive. Well, what, what does being alive mean? If something is alive, then it has a life. It has a beginning and an end. This does. It affects everything around it. It can cause changes in people. It can bring them up, lift them down. Um, you may think that other books are capable of doing that, but I'm going to tell you right now, they can't. All right? It don't matter if, if you're reading some of the great, like, Fitzgerald or um, Glenn Beck. The thing is, some of these people, you know, they're just about one thing, right? You know, it's Shakespeare. You know, it's, it's, we don't even know if Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. All right? It's up for debate. Some people don't know. You know, some people think that they did, they didn't. Some people think that's why they dig on Oak Island to see if his book's there or his autograph or something. I don't know. But I read Romeo and Juliet. I read Julius Caesar because I was made to. It didn't change my life. All right? You can read one chapter in this book 
and it will challenge you and move you and sustain you and give you hope and make you afraid and all just run the gamut of emotions. It's because it's not words from another human being. It's words from God. God spoke all of these words to the men that wrote down these words. God spoke them to them and wrote them down. Paul was so moved by the Holy Spirit that he started writing letters to churches, and those churches became canonized into our Bible. He wrote a couple letters to a young fellow named Timothy, the young preacher man, and he needed some encouragement, some direction, so Paul wrote him some letters. And not only did it change Timothy's life, but it changes our lives if we read it. I love my Bible. I... Over the years, I, I have one favorite, okay? And it's not like I shun the rest, but, you know, I've got some other Bibles at the house that I don't have a relationship with them the way I do my preaching Bible. Because this one's got all my notes in it, and it's got tabs, so, you know, it's easier to find stuff. And I know some people like, no, you need to memorize all of them, like, Listen, I learned the ABCs so that I didn't have to sit there and go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, G, H, G. Yeah, P comes after L. Okay, I got it. You know, but before you memorized it, you had to keep going through that little rhyme, right? Well, I've been given tabs. It's got all the alphabets on it. And I like it. So, when I'm looking up something in the Minor Prophets, I look at the tabs. Because I still can't get them in the right order. Well, okay, is, is, is uh, Obadiah before or after Nahum? And look at the tabs. Just before. Now, I... Is, I got that one. Nailed it. All right. I got the New Testament pretty much, but it's just in the middle. They're just, just some little bitty ones. You you turn to Philemon right quick, or Philemon, or ever how you want to say it. Turn to Jude. Look at it. You going to the Old Testament? You going to the New Testament? Tabs. My Bible's got them, and I love it. You want to be tabless? You be tabless. All right. You're going to be the same person looking in the first page which is a page of tabs. Right? How many people do I see at the Bible drill turn to the table of contents? I know you can't have tabs on, on a Bible drill, but if you did, you wouldn't have to look at the table of contents. You can memorize them all. Maybe we should. We'll get tabs message brought to you by tabs, not the soft drink. Have you ever got a book from the library that had tabs in it? What would you get? Not that. A dictionary or something like that, but it's divided by letters. You don't just, you don't just read a dictionary? You don't just read an encyclopedia? Who does that? Weirdo. Me. There wasn't nothing else to read. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about this book other than the tabs. When I got to study in this book, when I got serious with God and I surrendered my life to Him, not for salvation, but I'm talking about sold out, like grown up faith. Okay? A lot of y'all went through it where you came to believe in faith as a child, and you got saved as a child, but as far as spiritually maturing to the point where you started understanding things, that didn't happen until later on in life. And we've, probably all of us had a moment where all of a sudden things clicked, and you really got serious about God and what God was saying to you and about God's Word. And you weren't just preached to. You were reading it for yourself. God was talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. And all of a sudden, the Word became a 
alive. And, you know, it reminds me of that song by Casting Crowns that says, The Word is Alive. Um, that's a great song. And it just, the more I read, the more questions I had, the more things I was finding out about myself and about God and about the people that God had affected in in history and and the way He's going to change things and do things in the future and I'm like this this little book has so much impact on the world. Why is that? Because it's the word from God. It is inspired by God. It has no mistakes in it. It is. It's perfect. It is not contradictory. It is sufficient. It does not need anything else added to it. Um, it does not need parts taken away from it. It is perfect the way it is. Um, through much prayer and a lot of learned scholars have read many, many writings from people of the day that these passages were written. And some of them were inspired by God, but they were not included. There are some shows that you can see on TV called The Missing Books of the Bible, such as uh, the book of Andrew. If you ever if you want to read it, you can read it. I think uh, they have it on Kindle, or you can buy it on Amazon. You can read that. And almost every single word or passage out of the book of Andrew is included in the other Gospels. Um, so while they were debating whether to include that in the Holy Bible, it's like there's no need to canonize this because this is just repetition from the other four Gospels. So they just didn't include it. There were other letters from other people. Um, and after much prayer and guidance by the Holy Spirit, they were not canonized. You know, the Jewish folks have a bunch of different books that they go by. They were not included in our Holy Bible because they were more about, you know, the the oil and a lamp or something like that instead of uh, God and Jesus. It was more about their history. Our Holy Bible is exactly what God wanted it to be. If God wanted there to be other um, volumes of books placed inside of this book, they would have been. He would have inspired those people that were debating and canonizing the Bible many, 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 many years ago. So I believe that it is sufficient. I believe that it is perfect. And I also believe that it is the final authority for anybody who follows Jesus. You got a question in your heart, read in the Bible, you will find your answer. If you cannot find your answer in the Bible, I think that is the answer to your question. The answer is no. Well, what about this? The Bible's got an answer. You know, when we follow Jesus, we should never place our own tradition or our culture or our backgrounds or our feelings or our opinions. They should never come before the Word of God. The Word of God should be Alive. It should be the most important in our lives as a Christian. So if you've got some tradition and you consider that an exception to the rule, no, 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 no. This is the authority. The Bible says what needs to be said. Scripture is not against your traditions or your culture. It is instead of your traditions and your culture. The Scripture needs to be the basis that um, everything in our life is built around. If you cannot stand on the Word of God, what can you stand on? It's not any count. So, if it's not measuring up to the Word of God, and you're not standing on the Word of God, then it will crumble. It will not last. It will fall. You know, we live in a world where truth is... Um, to a lot of people, it's relative. And truths change. Truths um, are different for different people. Your truth may be different from my truth. And, and that's the world we're living in now. But there is absolute truth in the Bible. 
It has always been that way. It is not going to change. The, the words in this book have not changed over the years. The translations may have changed, but the meaning of those words have not changed. It is absolute truth. Now, if you don't like what it says, you might change your truth. I'm just not adhering to, to that because I want to live my life differently. That's your truth? That's not God's truth, so it ain't no count. We want to be masters of our own destiny. We want to be our own authority. And You know, there's a lot of teachers in this world that will sway you away from God's truth. Satan will get in your mind and give you validation and excuses and reasons to not follow God's truth. And that's just not... It's just not cool. Paul told Timothy here in uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, he said, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so Paul is telling Timothy that the Scripture is good. It's going to help you. You continue in it. Your, your mama and your grandma have been teaching it to you since you was a baby. Now you got a lot of learning about it. So continue on in that. It's going to bring salvation to you and other people. Now over in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge. Paul's like laying it on him right here. This is what you ought to do. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience, careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So, if we are to preach the Word, I reckon you got to know the Word. Right? If you're going to preach the Word, in order to preach, you've got to believe what it is that you're saying. Alright? Because if you are saying one thing, but believing something else, that's called acting. Alright? And if you're a very good actor, they put you on TV. I'm not saying anything about TV preachers. They're not actors. Not all of them. Um, some of them are great. I watch some most Sunday morning. Live from Gardendale, Alabama. Kevin Hambone. Anyway. Did y'all know James Spann is this how? You know that? Some people don't know that. I thought he was just a weather guy. He had a lot better news than Tornado Warning was over. But me and Frank just come down there to speak. I had to speak. Man of God. I knew he didn't cuss during the weather. Sorry. He had that going for him. But, uh, yeah, he got up and gave his testimony and talked. And, wow. Well, what I couldn't get over is that he was that tall. I thought he looked taller on TV. But the TV made me think something different about James Spann, that he was tall. 
but I didn't have the guts to ask him, do you wear suspenders for the vertical enhancement? Horizontal stripes on the shirt supposed to make you look thinner or taller or something like that? Anyhow, when you preach the Word of God, you got to have been a student of the Word of God, study the Word of God. Now, Paul told Timothy to be ready in season and out of season, which means all the time. Be able to give an account for what it is. Preach the Word. You have not read the Word or studied the Word. You don't know what the Word says. But let me tell you something. This is not a charge for you to go and try to memorize the whole Bible. Memorization is not the same as learning. Alright? I memorized the, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence or the preamble to the Constitution, whatever it was. And the way that I learned that was by repetition, memorization, and school I tried. There was a Bill, his name was Bill, and he sang it over and over. And in the seventh grade, I stood up before the class. And I closed my eyes and I saw And very awkwardly, and with a lot of shame, I would hum a line and then say it out loud. We the people. In order to form a more perfect union, yeah. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. To ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution of the y'all know this? United States of America. Yeah, y'all remember that? I memorized it. Now ask me what it means. There were words in there I didn't know how to spell. I memorized. And I recited it, and I have committed it to a part of this gray blob in my noggin. It's taking up space. But I can still sing it. And I say that with air quotes. Sing it. I remember. We down at uh, Epcot the other day. We were watching the American Experience. It's a cool show about the history of America. And the Constitution up there, it comes up on the screen and I see it, the preamble and that song goes off in my head and well, I know this. So I get to look at them words and y'all, this it was written in the old English where half the S's look like F's. I'm like, they didn't spell that right. I got to look and like, what's with all these F's? Like Possession has an F in the middle of it. That's not right. Oh, yeah, that's that old S. When there's two of them, they put one of them as an F, and some words start with a F. Anyway, I'm glad we changed that. Okay. Provide for the common defense. That's like tithing, paying taxes. Okay. All right. Secure the general welfare, taking care of the poor. That's biblical. Secure the blessings of liberty. Every man is free. We are endowed by the Creator. We are all created equal. You're not born better than anybody else. You're not born less than anybody else. That was a good thing to put in. A posterity? Does that mean we all need to stand up straight? Sitting there, I'm like, posterity, posterity. If only there was like a website that could look up things that I want to know. 
So I go to Google Posterity. The screen's not up there no more. And I'm like, T-O-S. Come on. Come on. Suggest it, I tell you. T, come on, suggest it. T-R-I-E-T-Y, posterity. R-I-T-Y. All right, we got it. Posterity. Strong and upright. So it is like standing up straight. Okay. If I hadn't uh, learned it years ago and seen it at the Epcot and still didn't know what that word meant and knew how to use my phone to Google something, I still wouldn't know what it meant. But it was by studying that, learning it in like 38 years. I finally knew what it meant. And y'all, sometimes studying the Bible is like that. You will understand all still not know what it means. Sooner or later, God will show you and current something that you need. But that it's because it's a lie. And now it's speaking to you in a whole new way. That's why Paul told Timothy that this scripture is God breathed. God has breathed it out. Now, you come to the Bible to find something out. Study it so that you are prepared to preach. In season and out of season. Oh, by the way, kids. Listen to me, you need to know this before you get old and, and, and you start uh, rebelling against it. All right? If you are a child of God, then you are called to preach. Every one of them. See, you are already in a group that is known as the called. Okay? Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says that we are to go and tell. Which means preach. That means that every single person who has faith in Jesus Christ and has been saved by the blood of the Lamb, you are to preach. It may not be a sermon from the pulpit. It may just be with your actions and the way that you live your life where you show people love and compassion and encouragement and stuff like that, but you are supposed to preach. How are you going to know what to preach if you don't know what the Word says? Now, for you know what I mean. When you were young, you got to an age where you believed that you knew everything that you needed to know. Some people never grew out of that. You will never know everything. Okay? When you approach the Bible and you're not teachable, then you're not going to learn what the Bible says. You need to have a posture of being humble and teachable in order to learn what the Bible says. You should absolutely resist this tendency that we have to just choose parts and be like, well, this is the part that applies to me. This won't apply to me. I'm not going to do this. I have never preached a sermon out of Song of Solomon. Never. I've never been led to. I have read it many times and applied what I have learned to my own relationship with my wife. Some people say that that's the only already chapter of the Bible. And when I first heard that, I said, oh, I want to read that. Let me see what, what's up with that, you know. I know it was like a love letter. I felt, I felt kind of like a spy when I was reading it the first time. I said, oh, should we be reading this? I put it in, I guess so. We'll read it. So I got to reading it, and I was like, Read it. Valentine's Day just went by. Keep that part going. All 
I see a lot of married folk in here. You need to not rekindle the fire, but okay. it. That's biblical. Mm-hmm. Y'all have trouble with the whole word. You got to take the whole Bible. Can't just choose part. They're like, well, that ship has sailed. Now, see, some of y'all got your minds in the gutter right now. Ships ain't got gutters. Well, I don't know, they might. They ain't been on a lot of ships. The cruise ships have gutters. The water just goes all in wherever it goes. I would like to think that on the ship of love, or the love boat, if you will, my sails are full of wind. I'm not just a little dinghy bobbing around. Nope. Golly, my kids are covering their head up. <laughs> this is the truth. Anyway, y'all read about read the letters Solomon was writing his girl. You're like, Whew. now too much information. I heard that. You can never give too much information when you're preaching. This is where you come for the information. Right? We were walking along the other day, and there's this thing called Disney feet. After you've been at Disney for two or three days, you develop Disney feet, where the bottom of your feet throb nonstop. And I don't care how good of a shape you're in, Imagine if you were in the NBA and you were trying to guard somebody that's hard to guard. All right? That's what it's like to walk in Disney. Because there are thousands and thousands of people in your way. It would be easy to just walk. But no, no, no. There's people darting in front of you with strollers. and There's the folk that have rented the powered little carts and there's no line. It's just chaos. So you're shucking and jiving and weaving and whatnot. And it all discombobulated. Your feet hurt, your back hurt, your ankles hurt, and all that and the other. And after about three or four days of this, me and my wife were both in that same boat. It wasn't the love boat at the time. It was the throbbing foot boat. It was like the SS Dr. Shoals, we uh, we could hardly walk. It was more of a waddle. Um, we held hands a lot. Not for love, but for support in one another. And we learned that interlocking of our hands made our hands hotter. So let's not do it that way. But instead, we did it like this. And it was so that we could help support one another. <sighs> we came back home after we sat in the car for like eight or nine hours. I was ready to walk. And the whole next day, it rained all day long. And I wasn't a fan of walking in the cold rain. So we did not walk. And I felt like I had just all this energy built up. Like my Disney feet were easing away. I needed to get them back. So you know what you do when it's raining outside and you want to walk? You go to sleep. My feet have healed. And I know that there's no amount of preparation that will get them back. I know this because of experience. I also know from experience that if you do
Do not read your Bible every single day. You're going to wind up out of shape. Okay? You can build up spiritual strength by reading your Bible every single day. So that when you do ingest something that's harder to swallow, it's not crippling. You understand what I'm saying? Maintain a good diet of the Word of God, and it will build up your strength, your stamina, your perseverance. It is going to make you wiser. It is going to give you more knowledge. You will actually mature in the Word of God. And the most beautiful thing is you're going to learn that it only matters what God thinks about you. Not what other people think about you. Watching you struggle to walk and weirdly holding hands. Doesn't matter. If the sun is out, you will wear an umbrella on your head to protect your head. People at Disney World do not care what they look like. Not all of them. Some of them need to. So anyway, do you spend time feeding on God's Word? This is my hope, that we as a church develop such a love for the Bible that we become spiritual fatties. Okay? I'm talking about overweight, obese, just blob from taking in the Word of God. Have you ever been called spiritually overweight? Hmm? Why not? I mean, I hadn't either. But that would be a huge compliment, wouldn't it? You know, I think you've been reading too to ease up off the Bible. You've been hitting it pretty hard, I can tell. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go to some... What would AA meeting be for the Bible? You understood? Yep. Going to a meeting Sunday morning. They're reading so much Bible. You want to come? They hook you out. It's called SS. Meeting. Not the German town. 